Shabbat Shalom. Today's uh, video sharing in two parts again is entitled Signed, Marked, and Sealed Unto Salvation. You know, so many Christians today are fascinated by the mark of the Antichrist or mark of the beast the number of his name, 666, and every time some um, developments in artificial intelligence or tracking device or whatever, they get very excited. But why don't Christians get excited about Yahweh's sign, Yahweh's mark, and Yahweh's seal? unto salvation. I find this quite interesting difference in terms of the focus of many Christians. So today I'd like to direct your focus on exactly this topic of Yahweh's sign, mark, and seal, without which we cannot get into the kingdom of heaven. Let me begin by quoting from the book of Romans, chapter 4 and verse 11, where Paul writes, And he, referring to Abraham, received the sign of circumcision, the seal of the righteousness of the faith, which he had yet being uncircumcised, that he might be the father of them that believe, though they be not circumcised, that righteousness might be imputed unto them also. Then in Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 30, Paul writes, And grieve not the Holy Spirit of God, whereby you are sealed unto the day of redemption. And again, in the book of Revelation, chapter 7, verses 2 and 3, this is what the Apostle John wrote. And I saw another angel ascending from the east, having the seal of the living God, and he cried with a loud voice to the four angels, to whom he was given to hurt the earth and the sea saying, Hurt not the earth, neither the sea, nor the trees, till we have sealed the servants of our God in their foreheads. Let me begin by talking about the sign of circumcision that was given to Abraham. Let me go to Genesis chapter 17, verses 3 and 4. And Abram fell on his face, and God talked with him, saying, As for me, behold, my covenant is with thee. Thou shalt be a father of many nations. Then let's go down to verse 10 of the same chapter. This is my covenant, which you shall keep between me and you, and thy seed after thee. Every man child among you shall be circumcised, and you shall circumcise the flesh of your foreskin. It shall be a token of the covenant between me and you. And he that is eight days old shall be circumcised among you. Every man, every man child in your generations, he that is born in the house or bought with money of any stranger which is not of thy seed. And earlier I mentioned what Paul said in Romans chapter 4, that he referred to circumcision, physical circumcision, as a sign given to Abraham. And the, uh, the Greek word that is translated as sign is simeon, simeon. G 
4592. So what does it mean? An indication, especially ceremonially or supernaturally, a miracle, a sign, a token of wonder. So it's a sign. Sign of what? A covenant between God and Abraham. If you read, go back and read the whole of Genesis chapter 17, you'll find that Abraham had found favor with Yahweh because what Yahweh promised him in terms of the land he was going to inherit for himself and his descendants and in terms of a son, a promised son, Isaac, even though he and his wife were already very, very old, the Bible says he believed Yahweh. He trusted Yahweh's promise. And for that trust, he was reckoned as righteous unto Yahweh, imputed righteousness. So this righteousness comes by faith. And the faith must be translated as trust. Trusting in what Yahweh has written, what Yahweh has promised. So, that blessing of imputed righteousness, Paul says, comes down to everybody who puts their trust in Christ, Yeshua the Messiah. Because, in the same chapter 17 of Genesis, Abraham's name was changed to Abraham because Yahweh declared he was going to be a father of many nations and not just of the Israelites or the house of Israel. But there was a particular sign given to him in respect of the promise of the land of Canaan that was going to begin to Abraham and his descendants forever, Yahweh gave him the sign of circumcision, physical circumcision. For him and his physical descendants, now some Christians are mistaken that everybody who comes to Christ must be physically circumcised. The Bible is very clear. <clears throat> this physical circumcision still applies to the Jews, every descendant of Israel, but not to Gentiles, because it's a peculiar, it's a special covenant between God and Abraham in respect of his physical descendants. And we know he, he, um, his wife gave birth to Isaac, and then you get Jacob and the 12 sons of Jacob and their descendants. So the promise is to that household, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob. It comes down that line, and it doesn't come through Ishmael, who was the uh, son that Abraham uh, obtained through sleeping with his uh, maid, Hagar, with his wife's uh, suggestion and permission because Ishmael is accounted as a child of the flesh. And as a child of promise is Isaac. So the promise will come down through the promised child Isaac, followed by Jacob, and so on. So that's very important. So we've seen that Paul in Romans chapter 4 equated the sign with a seal. Okay, sign and seal. Because the very chapter that we mentioned in Genesis 17, that the promise of Yahweh is also that since he made Abraham the father of all nations, so all of us who believe in Yeshua would have Abraham as the father of our faith. And just as Abraham had righteousness imputed to him, so we have righteousness imputed to us because of Yeshua's sacrifice upon the cross. So Yeshua became our circumcision 
And Paul talks about the circumcision of the heart. It comes about when we undergo the waters of baptism. In Romans chapter 6, we have seen this before. When we go through immersion in water, in baptism, we are immersed, baptized into the death and the burial of Yeshua. So that we'll die to the old man of sin, the flesh, or the carnal nature. And then, just as Yeshua rose from the dead, as we come up from the waters of baptism, we rise together with him symbolically in resurrection. Christ is a new man, a new creation in Christ. So you can see the significance and importance of the sign given to Abraham. At the same time, it was also a seal of righteousness. And we are beneficiaries of both the circumcision via the circumcision of the heart, because we are not Jewish, but the seal of righteousness has come down to us through faith, trust in Yeshua, our Messiah. How beautiful scripture is. Now, let me go on and talk about <coughs> another sign. And this is a sign of the Torah. Now, as I mentioned in the previous video, the Torah translated as the law of Moses, but strictly is the law of Yahweh, conveyed to Moses, his servant, that the Torah comprises three parts. One part comprises all the ordinances pertaining to the physical temple, about the priesthood, the Levites, the sacrifices that would be made, were the temple to be still around. That's one part of the Torah, and that doesn't apply to us or even to the Jews anymore because there isn't any physical temple. The second part of Torah has to do with civil law. For example, if a thief is caught, the hand will be cut off. Now, we can't do that on a person-to-person -person basis, if you catch somebody stealing for somebody else, you take a, a big chopper and you chop off his hand. That is not what scripture mandates. That pertains to the state of Israel because Israel was set up as a theocratic state. So a theocratic state would have laws of the land. We call it civil law. Okay? And when Yahshua comes back, to rule and reign in the millennium for 1,000 years, the Torah, the three aspects of Torah, will be applied. First, of course, the temple will be, there will be an Ezekiel temple uh, built, and uh, priesthood, but no high priest, because Yeshua is now our high priest. He has replaced the Aaronic uh, priesthood. But there will still be Levites and so on. You can read that in Ezekiel chapter 44 onwards. So that's the temple laws, the temple ordinances. At the same time, Yeshua will be king of kings and lord of lords over the entire world. And you and I, if we are called, chosen, and faithful, fit to be the bride of Christ, we would have been raptured beforehand and we'll be coming back with Yeshua at his second coming to help him rule and reign over the world. So we will be applying the civil law, the part of Torah. Then the third part of Torah, as I explained to you, is the moral law, the best encapsulated in the Ten Commandments. Now, a lot of the writings of um, Moses in Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, deal with the details of the Ten Commandments. So all of those, the moral law, would apply to all of us and apply 
today as well. And when we pass from this world, we go into judgment, and the judgment will be made on the moral law that is in the Torah itself, the third part of Torah. Okay, so uh, having that as a necessary background, we'll look at what is called the sign of Torah, the sign. Now turn with me to Deuteronomy chapter 6 and verse 6 to, to 8. And these words which I command you this day shall be in your heart, and you shall teach them diligently unto your children, shall talk of them when you sit in the house, when you walk by the way, when you lie down and you rise up, and you shall bind them for a sign on your hand. They shall be as frontlets between your eyes or on your forehead. And you shall also write them on the post of the house and on thy gates. Now the word that is uh, translated as sign in English is the Hebrew word of O-T-H. And the Hebrew number is H226 in the Strong's Concordance. And this simply means a flag, a beacon, a monument, an omen, evidence, a mark, a miracle, a sign, a token. So you can translate it as a mark or a sign. Okay? Remember, on your forearm, on your wrist, on your forehead. And later we'll see that there's another person interested in our forehead and our forehead. So, my suggestion is, why don't you preempt this guy and his name is called the Antichrist. If you have your forearm already marked with a sign by Yahweh, and your forehead already marked with a sign of the Torah, nobody else can add any other sign, any other mark. Okay, let me say a few more words about the Torah. Firstly, it is the Torah that set Israel apart as a nation from other nations, that made it a unique nation. And here I quote from the book of Deuteronomy, chapter 4, reading from verses 5 to 8. Behold, I have taught you statutes and judgments, even as Yahweh my God commanded me, that you should do so in the land where you go to possess it. Keep therefore and do them, for this is your wisdom and your understanding in the sight of the nations. We shall hear all these statutes and say, surely, this great nation is a wise and understanding people. Verse 7. For what nation is there so great, who has God so near unto them, as Yahweh our Elohim, in all things that we call upon him for? For what nation is there so great, that has statutes and judgments so righteous as all this law, which is set before you this day? So when Yahweh gave Israel to Moses, his Torah, he was not meant to put them in bondage, but rather to set them apart. Why? Because the Torah represents the standard of righteousness of Yahweh himself. We got to measure ourselves against Torah if we want to know what righteousness is all about. So many Christians claim, and we rightly claim, we are made righteous in Christ, in whom we entrust our lives to. That's correct. But 
they have no clue as to what that righteousness is all about. And the Bible is very clear that after you come to Christ, you begin to learn His ways, His word, including the Torah, the moral part of the Torah, as I explained earlier. It will help us to determine what is right, what is wrong, what is good, and what is evil, by which we can then use as a yardstick a measure of our own behavior, of our own character. And of course, we will struggle because we still have a fallen nature called the flesh that is very inclined to sin. And what is sin? Sin is disobedience to God's commandments, offending God because he says, thou shalt not, and you go ahead and do it. So we must know what is sinful and what is not so that when we can avoid sin, conquer sin, we can be visibly and outwardly righteous in addition to having the imputed righteousness of Christ in us. Otherwise, people will look upon us as hypocrites. You claim to be righteous in Christ, but your behavior is worse than non-Christians. I've heard this said, said of many a Christian over the years, that there are non-Christians whose behavior is more righteous than many Christians. And that really puts Christ to shame. So that's something that you want to bear in mind. So for those who dismiss the Torah, well, then what standard do you go by? You can't just claim to be righteous in Christ and then behave worse than the heathen. They cheat, they lie, they swindle people, they are covetous, they are drunkards, they commit immorality, and you do likewise, and perhaps even worse than what they do. So the world says, what's the difference between you and non-Christians? So what is that that makes us special? Not just having Christ in our hearts, having the Holy Spirit within, but the change in us. That's why right. it will take place gradually over the course of time. And then you begin to get comments from people. Ah, you know, this guy, I knew him 10 years ago, but he's now changed. He's different. Others come along and say, I see Christ in you. Now that's a supreme confident, uh, compliment that any Christian can get from anybody else. I see Christ in you. Meaning your conduct is so righteous that you remind me of Christ himself, of Yeshua himself. Okay, so that's what the Torah does. That when we adhere to Torah, we have a code of conduct for our behavior. We are set apart from the rest of the world. There are things that we will not want to do, even if we can get away with it, simply because Yahweh has said it in his word. And remember, we talk about love and uh, obedience. Yahshua said, if you love me, keep my commandments. Yes, the question is, which commandments? Just like the rich young ruler came to Christ, he says, how can I be good? How can I be righteous? Yahshua mentioned a number of commandments. But Yahshua didn't give him the whole list because Yahshua knew what his sins were. He said, I have observed all these. But those Christ didn't mention, he obviously didn't observe because his sin was worship of money, covetousness. So interestingly, Yahshua advised him, if you want to enter into eternal life, sell all you have, give to the poor and follow me. 
and the man went away sadly. Why? Because he loved money more than he loved God. And Yahshua said, you cannot serve God and mammon at the same time. You cannot serve God and mammon. Now this is a this is a instruction or a saying of Yeshua that every preacher must take to heart because every preacher sets the example for the flock. So if you attend the, the so-called mega church, you got hyper faith, hyper prosperity, gospel preachers, they are forever telling people how glorious it is to be rich in terms of money and material things and appealing to their covetousness in the process. That's how the churches grow so big. But are those people saved? Measured by Torah. Okay, so we're dealt with the fact that Yahweh gave the Torah to his people to set them apart from other nations. So you might ask me, but brother, we're not Jews, we're not Israelites. How does that apply to us? Well, for your information, if you read the Bible very carefully, especially in the book of Romans, Paul tells you that the law is universal. God's law is universal. It's not meant just for the Jews, meant for everybody and should you uh, miss the rapture and somehow survive the great tribulation of seven years and manage to get into the millennial kingdom of Yeshua you'll be shocked to realize that all three parts of Torah will be applied rigorously the Bible says with a rod of iron rod of iron okay temple laws civil law and moral law so watch it and what do you think will happen when <clears throat> you pass from this world paul says in the book of hebrew is appointed once for a man to die and after that the judgment for what basis will the judgment be be no less than the Torah, the moral laws of Father Yahweh. You know, I find it very interesting that <coughs> many Christians <coughs> want to do without the Torah, but at the same time, they talk about sin. Now, there's no sin if there's no commandment. So you abolish the commandments, abolish sin. So if Christ abolished the commandments of the cross, why do you need to go and preach the gospel to anybody? If you abolish the law, the Torah on the cross, then everybody in the world becomes righteous immediately. They become sinless immediately. What do they need redemption for? It's all applied to them automatically. So why do you evangelize? Why do I evangelize? And what do we say in evangelism? Repent and be baptized in the name of Yeshua the Messiah who died for your sins and rose from the dead and you shall receive the Holy Spirit. Repent. Repent of what? Your sins. What are sins? Offenses against God. How do you know it's an offense against God? You have broken His commandments. Ah. Which commandments? Think again. All right. Now, <clears throat> the next point that I want to make with you is that this same Torah sets followers of Christ apart from others. Just as Israel was set apart by the Torah from other nations, so those of us who come to Christ and put our trust in Him, the Torah actually sets us apart. How does it do it? Let me <coughs> take you to the book of Hebrews, chapter 10, verses 16 and 17. This is the covenant that I'll make 
with them after those days, says Yahweh. I will put my laws into their hearts, and in their minds will I write them, and their sins and iniquities will I remember no more. Now, again, lots of Christians and preachers use these two verses in the book of Hebrews to say that, look, we are under the new covenant, we are not under the old covenant, so the Ten Commandments do not apply to us anymore. <laughs> but please read carefully. What does it say? This is the covenant, the new covenant. What is the new covenant? I will write my laws, my Torah, into their hearts and in their minds, I will write them. Now listen, under the old covenant, you would have read from the Bible, the book of Exodus, that the Ten Commandments that were given by Moses were written on tablets of stone, two tablets of stone, by the finger of Yahweh, by the finger of God. And guess what we just read in Hebrews 10, verse 16 and 7? Under the new covenant, the same commandments are written on the tablet of the heart and of the mind by the Holy Spirit. You will say, but brother, how is this so? Well, this is how I think it works. When you come to Christ the right way and put your trust in Him, you receive the Holy Spirit. And when you receive the Holy Spirit, He will teach you what is true and what is false, what is righteous and what is unrighteous and wicked and evil. You will come across the commandments of Yahweh. You will be convicted by the Holy Spirit that you have to obey these are uh, Yahweh's standards of righteousness. That's how he writes them on our hearts and on our minds. So if you are truly born from above, truly have the Holy Spirit, you will acknowledge that the commandments are valid and we need to obey them. Not in terms of trying to earn our salvation, but simply to manifest our salvation to the world that we are changed by the Spirit of Yahweh to become righteous people in our behavior. We, do no, long, we no longer cheat, we no longer lie, we are not covetous, uh, covetous. We, are, we keep the Sabbath holy, we honor our parents, we don't worship other gods, we don't make any images or idols or whatsoever, we don't take the name of Yahweh in vain. We don't bear false witness against anybody. That's right. All those are in the Ten Commandments. Okay. Then the Old Covenant was ratified by the blood of oxen being sprinkled on the people. That's what Moses did. He took oxen, took their blood, part of it sprinkled in the tabernacle, and part of it is sprinkled on the people. For what purpose? to seal the covenant. And when he doing so, the people declared, we will follow the Torah. We accept the Torah. And here we covenant, promise to Yahweh, we will obey him. It's a bit but rather foolish on their part because no man can obey Torah fully. That's why we need salvation. Christ, was the only one to be able to obey Torah fully on our behalf. So they made a foolish undertaking. Yahweh allowed it. And through their failures, He gave them a Savior who also became our Savior. But happily for us, the new covenant that we just talked about is also ratified by blood. This is by the blood of Yeshua himself. Every covenant, if you read about in the Bible, in the ancient world, had to be ratified by blood. See? See, among the gangsters, mafia people, very often they cut finger or cut 
part of their vein and mingle their blood together and swear allegiance to each other and so on. Just ratifying a covenant and sealing it with blood is common uh, in the world. So we have a new covenant ratified by the blood of Yeshua, no less. And here I turn to Matthew chapter 26 and verse 27. And he took the cup and gave thanks and gave it to them, saying, Drink ye all of this, for this is my blood of the New Testament, New Covenant, which is shed for many for the remission of sins. You see, the uh, Old Covenant could only provide for a blood covering that enable worshippers to enter into the temple to worship Yahweh, but it could never cleanse their conscience. Whereas the blood of Yeshua given to us a remission of sins, wiping away the slate clean of all our past sins. And every time we confess, repent and confess of the new sins, he does the same thing. Okay, the next point, for Christians who believe they are not obliged to keep the commandments of Yahweh, my question is, are they part of the new covenant? And do they really have the Holy Spirit? Now, I don't raise these questions uh, frivolously or in condemnation, but rather out of concern. I'm particularly concerned about pastors and teachers, self-confessed apostles and prophets who go around exhibiting some spirit. They can do some signs and wonders, but beware. If these are preachers who tell you that you don't need to obey the commandments anymore, you can get what you like by faith, insisting that you believe something and therefore Yahweh, Yahweh must deliver to you and that you are entitled to prosperity in this world. You want to think again because Paul says Satan has many ministers in the churches that are masquerading as what they call ministers of light. They look like genuine ministers of the gospel and they're able to do signs and wonders. I've seen quite a few of them on YouTube. I won't go into detail because there are other preachers on YouTube who take these, some of these people to task. And I don't think that's my job. My job is to stress the positive part of the gospel to teach you what Yahweh says so that you will not fall into the snare of the devil and fall into the trap of false preachers. So, if you read the Bible very carefully, you'll find that if you're truly under the new covenant, you will receive the Holy Spirit. And this Holy Spirit is the one who gives us a new birth of being born from above and the power to overcome sin. How do I know this? If you turn to Ezekiel chapter 36, verses 26 and 27, this is what we read. A new heart also will I give you, and a new spirit will I put within you. And I will take away the stony heart out of your flesh, and I'll give you a heart of flesh. And I'll put my spirit upon you and cause you to walk in my statutes. You shall keep my judgments and do them. Underline especially verse 27. That if we truly have the Holy Spirit, the desire to walk in righteousness, the desire to obey Yahweh's commandments will be there. And not only the desire, 
but we are given power to overcome sin, power over the flesh. And in the Romans chapter 8, go and read it. It's vital for your salvation. By the Spirit, we have put to death the deeds of the flesh. We have power to the Holy Spirit to overcome sin. This is the new covenant. The same commandments are there, but now we have power over sin. That's right. And to walk in newness of life. The choice is yours. The choice is mine. If we have the right Holy Spirit, the correct Holy Spirit. So let me repeat. For me, the sign that a, a Christian really is part of God's family, he will have the Holy Spirit. And how do I recognize it? When the commandments of Yahweh are preached and taught, there will be acceptance. And the person will want to try and walk in righteousness in terms of behavior. Who want to change the behavior will every day be crying out to the Lord Lord I've done it again please forgive me give me the power never to fall into temptation again and if you are that kind of a Christian you will find as I have found over the years that gradually we get to overcome different areas of sin in our lives. It takes time. It takes time. But you must have that stirring inside you that you, you don't feel peace inside when you're in sin. I know when I'm in sin and one of the, one of the effects of being in sin is that the desire to read the Bible gets less and less. That's right. So when you find yourself avoiding the Bible, there's something wrong. Begin to put it right by putting the sin right to repentance, asking for forgiveness. And he is very gracious. You forgive. And then your love for scriptures can be renewed. I find that sin affects my anointing. Sin affects my putting messages like this together. And whenever I struggle and I can't get things easily, I go down on my knees and ask the Lord, show me my sins. And He will. And once He shows you, you confess, then you can feel the anointing returning your love for scriptures increasing. Okay? My experience is in consonant, in agreement with Yahweh's word that I just proclaimed unto you. A new heart, a new spirit, and then the spirit gives you the power, the dunamis, the ability to overcome sin. First of all, to recognize that Yahweh's commandments are valid. If anyone says they're not valid anymore, I have a big question mark. What kind of spirit do they have? Okay. Now, let me pause there for the first part of this presentation. And then in the second part, I'll begin talking about the sign of the Sabbath.